Does anyone remember where I was? Anybody? Recollect what I was supposed to do yesterday before I got off on the subject of the tick birds. Yes? Oh, the Ecclesia at Sardis. Yes, thank you very much. This is Martin Zender, once again, the Lord of the Laundry Room, running things here with the washer and the dryer uh, in tow over here, as usual. Things going on uh, dependably, predictably. Well, not exactly predictably, because I don't know what's going to happen, because once again, I'm going to go th into the Church of Sardis, the Ecclesia of Sardis, in the future. I have not purposely have not looked at it before the show so that I can give you my immediate impressions and I think there is some value in this uh, as for the tick birds <clears throat> yeah they're called tick birds because a particular irritant on the back of the rhinoceros is the tick it is a devious hateful horrible creature that just tortures other animals it's a parasite gets on the backs of the animals and the rhino is thinking won't somebody help me and there's the tick bird guess what the tick bird loves to eat ticks so it's mutually uh, beneficial and it's so great how God orders his universe like that and it really speaks to one of my topics in Indianapolis which is the opposites attract God hates equality you see God hates equality what if everybody had parasites and nobody liked to eat parasites that would be equality what if everybody liked to eat parasites but there were no parasites you get what i mean is that everybody is made differently so that we can complement one another and opposites do attract and <clears throat> sometimes i think they attract too much gosh you know i have a i'll say something before i launch into the sardesians those are the people from sardis the sardesians is that seems to me that God puts all the wrong people together, uh, you know, like marriages or friendships, not friendships, but marriages, I'm thinking specifically. Many people I know are frustrated, many people. I mean, nobody within the sound of my voice who's married is not somehow frustrated. I'll never forget that Three Stooges uh, routine. It was so funny. The Three Stooges are census takers. Uh, they got hired for a temporary gig, and Mo goes up to a house to take a census. Per a lady answers the phone. He goes, excuse me, he has his notepad. Excuse me, ma'am, are you married or happy? Yeah, well, marriage has nothing to do with being happy. It has to do with love. It has to do with dedication to your uh, dearly beloved. Yes, uh, and the topic would come up, what is the difference between love and in love? Yeah, I don't know. In love may be a Hallmark card. I think there's sexual passion and there's love. Now, these two are sold separately. They can be sold separately. When they come together as a package deal, it's a wonderful thing. You can love someone that you don't have sexual passion with, and you can have sexual passion with someone you don't love. And when the two come together, when you have love and sexual passion, that's an amazing thing. That's probably what most people mean by in love. But again, again, I haven't mentioned it yet. The love of God is that love which is sourced from within and it goes out to its object and the worthiness of the object is not considered. That is true love. When you love someone and you love them irrespective of their deeds, irrespective of their worthiness. The love of God cannot be denied. This is agape love. Filio love, which is appropriate here because we're going to be speaking about the church in Philadelphia. That was the name of the city in Asia Minor. It will be the location of a future ecclesia. Philadelphia, filio is fondness so it's a fondness for someone we call it the city of brotherly love philadelphia even though i'm not sure how much love goes on in the uh, eastern pennsylvania city of the same name but nevertheless the idea is that with this kind of love it's a step down from god's love it is based on fondness it is based on affection it is based on the worthiness of the object in other words, I love you or I like you because you like me, because you're a nice person, because you're wonderful, because you soothe me, because you interest me. This is filio. And it's the love, again, based on behavior, really. But the love of God, agape love, this is the highest form of love. It can't be denied. 
because it's sourced from within completely and it loves because that's what it is. It just washes over the objects of its affection, whether they're joiks or not. Now, chapter 3, Revelation, I'm going to be, again, just touching on these ecclesias as I get impressions based on scriptural knowledge, based on the knowledge that I have gained over 30 years of study. So this isn't some this isn't some frivolous thing where I have, I'm just giving you my emotions and my feelings like a Pentecostal guy. I'm not. Every word I read, it usually triggers some other passage of scripture I remember from my copious amounts of learning. And, and if I have no impressions, like the bronze feet, the other day I mentioned the bronze feet of, of the Savior. I had nothing on that. I got nothing. I got nothing on the bronze feet. I can't help you there. I don't know. Burning bronze, was it? Yes, I don't understand it. And I'm not in the mood to look into it right now. I could, but I don't think it's that important right now. To the messenger of the Ecclesia in Sardis write. And again, I am applying these to the future Ecclesias that will be there in modern day Turkey. Now this, he is saying who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I am aware of your acts. Always acts. Always with the acts. I told you, it's always with the acts. Contrast 2 Timothy 1.9. We are called not according to acts. I am aware of your acts that you have a name that you are living and are dead. Here we go. Once again, the common thread with all these ecclesias seems to be an impression made that is false. That is a portending to be something that one is not. The old whitewashed tomb routine that Jesus Christ gave us, that is the death knell of many, many people because many, so many are not interested in going beneath the surface. And so they look at the the uh, the statement they look at the outward uh, the outward show they look at the outward announcement this is how i am this is i am i'm a prophetess oh i am of the church of jesus and you find out that they're not so once again we have someone who has a name that you are living and are dead many will say to me i brought this verse up to you many times in matthew many will say to me according to jesus in that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this in your name? Didn't we do mighty works in your name? Didn't we perform great miracles in your name? And he said, "I." he will say, I never knew you. How can he say that? Because they're really dead. That's why I hate zombie movies. How anyone can like zombie movies, I hate the duplicity. I hate that the dead are alive. It's the most disgusting thing to me, even philosophically or m metaphorically, that the dead could be alive. T to see it is even worse. What the hell is the matter with people who like zombies? It's, for one thing, I hate death being glorified. But more than death's not being glorified, look how ugly they are. No, but the dead are alive. It's this thing like this deceit, this, a deception. The dead are not alive, the dead are dead. And those who say they're alive but who are dead, and of course dead here is being used metaphorically. You are living but you are dead. It's not a zombie in this passage of Revelation 3. It's simply that you are dead to the things of God. You're non-responsive. It's a metaphor. It's as though you're dead. And yet you come across, you tell people, you act all that I'm living. I'm alive. I'm alive. Look at me. But you're not. You're dead because watchful. Become watchful and establish the rest who were about to be dying. For I have not found your acts completed in the sight of my God. So there will be some in Israel who are going to be establishers. And they will, they will grab the living dead by the shirt collars, shake them and say, wake up, probably slap them with a classic movie slap. I always love the femme fatales in movies who would like slap the man like boom. Boom. And it was like, ooh, instant wake up call. Or, you know, usually it's a woman scorned, you know, they boom, slap. But this is the kind of thing we're seeing in here that there are those who are going to be, what's the word used? Watchful, establish. They're going to be establishers. They're going to be those who rise to the top, shake the shirt collars, slap the faces in love, right? You hurt the one you love. You, It's, it's purposeful pain. It's Faithful are the wounds of a friend. That's exactly what it is. Establish the rest who are about to be dying. For I have not found your acts completed in the sight of my God. Remember then how you have obtained and 
hear, H-E-A-R. Keep it and repent. So there was some good going on with these people. They had a history of some good acts, but their acts are not completed because they're always on the brink of being deceived by other people. This is why God, you might not realize this, you look at the Old Testament and you realize why was God so rapidly interested, so rapidly careful of his people that he did not want them intermarrying with other nations. When they went in to conquer other nations, it's like there was wholesale killing and that people who disobeyed the law and mingled were stoned is because he wanted to keep his people pure from influences because one bad apple spoils the whole bunch. Yes, I know you, some of you. You want to go into church. You want to go into a dangerous place and you want to be the one who changes people. You want to be the one who goes in there and makes a difference. I just want to make a difference. Martin, of course you do. And I admire your goal. I admire that that's your disposition. However, what is generally going to happen is you are going to go in there and you are going to be overwhelmed by the majority because it is very seductive in these freaking Christian churches. Human philosophy, according to Paul in Colossians chapter 2, is extremely seductive. So it won't be the fact that you're going to change them. They're going to change you. Yeah, it's like taking one puff of a cigarette. It's like, whoa. <laughs> now see, I smoke cigars. And uh, once in a while, if somebody's smoking a cigarette, I try it, but I'm, I'm, I've never smoked cigarettes, and I never inhale them. But one time, I decided to inhale just to see what the thrill was about. What is this inhaling? So I, I inhaled it, and I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> I like it, so i got to stay away from it. So th this is the whole thing. It's, a, it's one puff of the, the um, apostasy, and you're, you're hooked, so stay away from it. Become watchful. Remember, then, how you have obtained and how you have heard. Keep it and repent. If ever then you should not be watching, I shall be arriving on you as a thief, and under no circumstances will you be knowing what hour I shall be arriving on you. Ooh, this is the circumcision gospel all over. You remember Jesus' parable of the ten virgins. Was it five and five? Yeah, five were watchful, five were ready. They had their lamps ready for the bridegroom. The others were slothful, and somebody said, Here comes the bridegroom. And they were racing around at the last minute. Racing around at the last minute. I have an acquaintance who has this memory of her mother always in the car putting on her makeup. Always in the car putting on her makeup. And you see people driving, women especially. Um, they're driving, putting on their lipstick, putting on their mascara. And it's like, weren't you ready? Why don't, you, why don't, why, why don't you get ready before you drive? Well, it's because people procrastinate. Look, I'm guilty of it as ever. I always put my makeup on before I leave. <laughs> no, but listen, this is a very serious matter for the circumcision. However, with us, we have a statement by our Apostle Paul that whether we are watching or drowsing, I've given you that verse many times. Do I have to look it up this morning? Whether we're watch watching or drowsing, we will be together with Christ. So this is another major difference, and I think it's listed at the back of the first idiot in heaven is one of the major differences. My lighting here is very poor here. Hang on a second. Drowsing. You really, you have to have this. I can hardly see. I don't have my glasses on. Drowse. Okay, here it is. First Thessalonians 5.10. I want you to go to first Thessalonians. You want me to go? Okay. First Thessalonians 5.10. This show you now one of the big differences between us and the circumcision speaking about our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for our sakes, that whether we may be watching or drowsing, we should be living at the same time together with him. Wherefore, console one another and edify one another according as you are doing also. So the consolation, the edification here is the same probably as it is in the circumcision, but it's the, the requirements are not the same. The circumcision has requirements. It's a mixture of law and grace. We have unadulterated grace but you have a few names in sardis which do not pollute their garments it's all metaphoric polluting your garments they're not playing in a sandbox they're not playing tackle football and getting grass stains on their white pants okay and they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy there's a few names in sardis so 
these churches that are going to be developing are indeed still developing. So, you know, at one time I might have thought that September 23rd announces the ceiling of the 144,000. In fact, someone once said, someone wrote me and said, are you saying, Martin, that the 144,000 are sealed on this date? And I realized, no, I'm not saying that at all. This is the beginning of them. They're called out and then they're perfected. And there are still some among them who are being pulled toward the flesh, being pulled toward the Lycanaeatans, being pulled toward those who would pursue the popular thing, the mainstream thing. The one who is conquering, he shall be clothed in white garments, and under no circumstances will I be erasing his name from the scroll of life. We can't be erased from the scroll of life. For one thing, I don't think we're in the scroll of life. We've been chosen in Christ before the disruption of the world. It's never said that we're in a scroll of life, is it? Show me the verse. The scroll of life has to do with Israel, I believe, mainly. There's the book yeah, There's the book of life in Revelation. might be the same thing. I'm a little confused about those scrolls and the books, but this is a general logging of humanity at the great white throne, the book of life. So there may be different ones. I'm really not clear on that. I will be avowing his name in front of my father and before his messengers. But even in Israel, there are degrees of salvation. Paul talks in Hebrews about a better resurrection. And so this applies to the Hebrews, to the Jews. So I think that's what we're seeing here. There will be some who will enter the kingdom and who will be part of the kingdom, but they won't be like clothed in glowing white garments and shepherding the nations with a rod of iron. They won't be doing that. because they're not worthy for that, but they're still partaking of the kingdom. Moving on, who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the Ecclesias. And now in verse 7, we are getting to the messenger of the Ecclesia in Philadelphia. I'm tempted just to buzz through Philadelphia right now, but I'm going to save that for tomorrow. What You know, I've noticed that my videos have gone long lately. I haven't even noticed, I didn't even notice this was happening until a few days ago. The standard issue uh, length for a video is like 13 minutes, 14 minutes for two years. And then I started really talking to you and I felt so relaxed with you. And I'm going through these ecclesias and I'm looking at my time and it's like, my gosh, it's like I'm sitting in a living room just so comfortable relaxing with you and talking about God as things occur to me and the time is going and going and going. So I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to stop here before I go to Philadelphia. But even though it is not required of us, as it is required of the church of Sardis, the Sardisians, it's not required of us to watch, to wait, to be attentive. It's not required of us to follow those who would wish to establish us. Now, this is my part of my role is to establish you. Paul said he wanted the saints to be established. So there is a part of this in our evangel. Here, once again, I'm picking one word. This is the word standing out to me from the Sardesians, and I'm giving it to you, and I'm Paulizing it. Paul wants the saints to be rooted and grounded in the truth. He wants them to know beyond a shadow of a doubt what the truth is. He wants them to come more and more to wisdom, to realization. And he's establishing ecclesias. This is what Paul is doing. Now, in this case, with the Sardesians, John writing to them and Christ moving among them, this establishment is necessary for their survival. Whoever does not overcome will not eat of the tree of life. So, the establishment is essential for them. Otherwise, they're lost. And it's very easy for them to go astray because they're so tempted in the flesh. We have no fear of losing membership in the body of Christ. Once saved, always saved. We're not on probation. God's not waiting for us to screw up when he's going to pull the rug out from under us. No, that's the God we were used to in Christianity. Yet this word establish is so important for coming to maturity, for coming to a place of an allotment in Christ, to be founded. 
and not be blown about by every wind of teaching. This one thing is making me crazier than anything else in the body of Christ, and that is this idea that we owe everybody a hearing, that if somebody has a new idea or a new thought about something, that we owe them a hearing, and it's only polite. We have to, Martin, I just had to listen to this guy. I had a, a brother who was at the Indianapolis conference who thanked me. This is his, these are his exact words. He thanked me, Martin, Martin, you remember the time when I was, he was starting to listen to someone who was giving him some wacky teaching and he was, he was listening to the teaching. He was disturbed by the teaching. I can't remember what it was. It doesn't matter, but it was, it was off. It was obviously off, but I think this brother felt it was only the right thing that since this other person sending him this crap was a friend that he owed him a hearing. And by hearing it, by listening to it, this is what I was telling you earlier, it started to seep into him and he started to doubt everything he believed about the truth. I went into alarm mode because this man at the Indianapolis conference back when he was being rocked, he sent me a link. Martin, check this out. I think we should look at this. What do you think about this? And I looked at the link. It was a, t a video, I think, and I instantly like bristled like this, this is horrible. And it I made, it made me wonder why is this brother even entertaining this stuff? So I came at him with in no uncertain terms because I'm an establisher and I said, what are you doing even listening to this? You are rooted and grounded in your evangel. You're being dissuaded by an enemy. You're giving place to a deceiving spirit and you're starting to be blown by every wind of teaching. I'm persuaded of better things concerning you. I mean, I was tough on him because I loved him. This is so great. And at the conference, he said, many, he said more than once, he goes, Martin, do not ever stop kicking my ass. Now, see, this is what the establishers do in, among the Sardesians here in the in last days of Millennium 6. They establish them. But this is to save their life for Aeonian life. We already have Aeonian life, whether we're established or not. We have to know the truth. I'm not saying we don't have have to know the truth we have to be versed in the essentials of paul's gospel the death of christ for sin his entombment and his resurrection with nothing else added all right we have to know that but this establishment is is not going off many people in paul's lifetime while he was in jail they went off they went to they went to various little sub teachings or they were interested in the world or something happened to them and maybe they lost their allotment of, of ruling and reigning with Christ but Paul never wanted that to happen to anybody so this guy says to me Martin thanks for kicking my ass and he told other people he pointed to me at the conference he said this guy he kicked my ass he loved me he cared about me enough and in no uncertain terms he kicked my ass I'm just quoting him I don't usually speak this way <laughs> so Thank you, brother, for acknowledging the fact. It's hard to be that in someone's life. As I told people at the conference, and I'm telling you now, the charge of Paul for teachers is to expose, rebuke, and entreat. That's not a fun thing to expose and rebuke. I basically rebuke this man. Martin, who gives you the authority? I find myself in this position in the body of Christ. Simple. It's a God-given thing. It's not like I have a diploma that says that uh, you have completed your course in exposure and rebuke, and now you are qualified to, to establish other people and to adjust them. No, this is a thing of God. Am I also subject to adjustment and rebuke? Of course, I don't hold myself above anyone else, and neither should you. It's just a role. It's just a role, one of my roles in the body of Christ. I expect you to do the same for me. You better be coming with scripture. You better be coming with a conviction. You better be coming with facts and logic and not an emotion or a dream or an impression. So thank God that the body of Christ is an organic. Here I go again. Look, 24 minutes. The body of Christ is an organic organism. And it already consists of those who act as pastors and teachers and evangelists. A pastor is somebody who cares for your life, cares for your well-being. An evangelist is somebody who takes this message where it's not heard and also shares it and and with the other saints. A teacher, on the other hand, is more like more like the, the more like the hard ass kind of 
teacher takes brings you the information brings you the facts and establishes you and guards you and just like sets up around you and, and keeps would want to with his deepest heart keep you from being dissuaded from the truth keep you from being seduced by the philosophies of the world keep you from any hint of the circumcision like in paul's day when they crept in like insidious insects trying to spy out your freedom in christ and bring you in subjection to law no i'm going to keep that from happening to you i'm going to keep that from happening to you and i expect you I expect you, if you see me coming into any crazy thing, I expect you to do the same thing for me. We are here for one another with the common mind of Christ.